My name is Jameis Charles. I'll be talking about migrating critical apps to React. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a UI engineer at PayPal. Um, I've been on the Send Money team for about 14 months. And uh, today I'll be talking about some of the lessons that we learned um, starting a gradual migration to React. So let's go way, way back in time to the year 2014. So in 2014, when I joined the team, Send Money looked kind of like this. <laughs> I don't think it's changed much since 1999, actually. So on the back end, it was a C++. On the client side, this custom XML markup. Really not a great dev experience. It took a long time to ship things. It was just not great. So our team's charge was to build and roll out the new Send Money experience which looked like this. So it was a modern stack using Node, Kraken. On the server side and on the client side, it was RequireJS, Backbone, and the Dust templating language. So when I joined, um, we'd ramped up to about 5% in the US. And over the next few months, that climbed to about 100% in the US. So things worked really well for a while. We were pretty happy with it. One thing we really liked about Dust is that it allowed us to share our templates on the server and on the client pretty seamlessly. And this came in really handy when we moved our server rendered app to a single page application. But then our team had a little hackathon. We wanted to find a way to try and make our send money flow feel faster. We came up with this. Uh, this is the first page of this flow. You can, you can click on somebody, there's more animations, it kind of resize, it just feels a lot more slick, it feels faster. We saw a jump in our metrics uh, when we started implementing this. So now we run into the issue though of having to support two flows as we ramp up our new flow and start ramping down our old flow, right? So it's the same code base and a lot of the logic is shared between these two experiences but really the different thing here is two different templates, maybe a few different views, but everything else is shared. And this is where things started getting ugly for us pretty fast. Some of the issues we ran into was way too many abstraction layers. We had low confidence that when we would fix something over here, it would stay fixed, or that fixing something here wouldn't break something over here. And we had a lot of weird and difficult state bugs. You would select a currency code, you'd go forward one page, maybe go back, the currency code had been changed, it was just wrong, it was very painful to troubleshoot. So one example of the abstraction layer problem, so say right here you have a list of currency codes, right? Say the second one, Australian donuts, you wanna change this to something else because they've changed the uh, currency code in Australia. Now they wanna use dollars, finally. So, Debugging this is really painful because you have to find out, okay, where does this state live? Where does this list come from? So you end up going on this hunt, right? Through all these layers, and it feels like swimming upstream. So here you see, you get through seven layers of abstractions before you get to the API finally, and you're like, okay, this is the team I have to talk to get this figured out. This is extremely painful, especially because each one of these points is a gap you could fall into and get lost very easily. And so we're at a point where things are pretty bad. Everything is not awesome, okay? We're sad, it's really frustrating, but we have to balance our frustration with the fact that we have 100 million users in more than 100 countries for our flow, okay? We can't just up and change and break stuff whenever we want to just because we think this next framework is awesome and we want to move to it. We have to be responsible and have the appropriate amount of rigor. So what do we do? We start exploring, we start looking around. One thing we looked at was Ember. The thing we liked about Ember was the fact that it was very opinionated and it offered a lot of structure that our app was really missing at the time. We were also interested in React, but um, it looked interesting, but we just didn't know enough about it at this point. So uh, one guy on our team started experimenting with Ember. I think we even shipped something to, uh, to prod with it. And then, uh, like, okay, 
maybe Ember will work for us. And we started seeing these tweets about Ember. And, and I'm going to show some of them here. Now, I blurred out the name to protect people, but tweets like this. <laughs> and this. And this. And then it just turns a flame war. Now, this next one is probably my favorite. Now, I don't know if this is an endorsement or criticism of it, but I don't know. Seems like they've kind of made some peace now and things are a little bit calmed down. But, okay, so we looked at Ember. Now we also wanted to look at React. A few weeks later, React Conf came around, and at this point, we'd done our homework with React. We'd done a bunch of research. We'd hacked a few proof of concepts together. And we were kind of on the fence. Do we send some people to EmberConf or to ReactConf? And uh, the reality is that ReactConf happened sooner, so we went there. <laughs> <laughs> so about five of us went to ReactConf. And uh, it was really exciting. You could feel the excitement in the room. And I think the thing that was most exciting for us was that Facebook was having a lot of the same problems that that we had had and that we were having still. And for them, it appeared that React was solving a lot of these problems. We loved the focus on functional style and principles, and we, and we realized that these principles would solve a lot of our problems. We bought into all the ideas behind React. Simplify state, immutable data, functional principles, and we knew we could start doing some of these things now. So we thought, okay, let's try React. PayPal is a big company, though. We have a big app, we have a lot of members, we have a lot of people using it. So we sat down and we looked, okay, what do we actually need to change in order to start using some of these things? One of the big blockers was INTNN. How many people here use INTNN? Show of hands. Okay, maybe half, okay. So let's step through real quick what INTNN looks like for us. We have a property file, which is essentially a content file, um, similar to JSON. And we have the US version of the content there. We have the German version right below. And what happens is this gets merged with the Dust template below that. And then we get a JS file localized for ENUS, English speakers in the US, that looks something like this. And we then use require.js to load this in. And it gets loaded up on the page and rendered through, through Dust. Um, now, the first problem here was that React can't really load property files. And we couldn't get off of property files because we had a lot of processes that used these. So first thing we did is we needed to convert property files to JSON. So we had a grunt task that moved these things to the prop files to JSON. The, the, the second thing is that we made an, I, an IETN mixin that used React Intel. And let's look at that for a second. OK. So in this code, the important parts are are really this. We're loading in the IE10N um, mixin. We're specifying where the file is, whose keys we care about for this widget, and then we specify the key that we want to inject here. And then there's magic that says, OK, you're a US user, bring in the US key, et cetera. <clears throat> so now IE10N works. Now is a big blocker. Now we move on to our next issue. We're on require.js. Okay, who's on require.js? Wow, small, okay. Who, uh, who's on Webpack? Okay, about half. Who's on something else? Who doesn't use the module loader at all? Okay, everybody's afraid to say they are. <laughs> all right, so there are two big issues with require.js for us. One is that client-side dependencies for testing was really hard with Mocha. It was just a huge pain. The second one, this is a really big issue, is that the React ecosystem is really built around NPM. If you want to try out Flux or Redux or Alt or any of these frameworks, it's really easy to, to NPM install and pull these down. But with Require.js, it's just it's super painful to experiment with things like that. So those things are really easy, though, with Webpack. So um, one of my coworkers, uh, Jamin Ferguson, he's here somewhere. He moved us over to Webpack, and uh, the actual work only took about two days. He wrote a big blog post about it on the PayPal engineering blog. Go look at it. Um, it took him about two days of work. Um, then he opened the PR, 
And that sat open for a few weeks because we were, we were testing it, we were, we were going back and forth on certain things, but then it, it, it got merged in and we all loved it. Everything is awesome, okay? But why did we like this so much? So there are some great things that Webpack gave us immediately. Client-side require of NPM modules. Everybody on our team loved this. It made things so much easier. It was really nice to break functionality out, put it on NPM, that way the three teams, the three sister teams we had that were all sharing the same modules, we didn't have to manually copy things back and forth anymore. We could, we, uh, we could push them up to our internal private NPM instance. Another thing is you can finally start using CommonJS. It also made it really easy to use Babel Loader, which supports JSX, makes it really easy to use JSX and ES6. This allowed us to preserve our old code, and without having to update or change anything, allowed us to use new features like ES6, CommonJS, so the old and the new could live in harmony. That made everybody happy because it, the, uh, the cost of trying out new things was really low, and that makes people happy when they can try new things. Okay, so you might think, do I have to do all these infra, infra changes before I can move to React? Well, the fact is you should be doing all these things anyway. At this point, this is best practices. This will exist your existing, this will improve your existing workflow. So let's see one example. We can start using ES6 modules right now. So we have some AMD code, and we want to move this over to use ES6 module imports. Here's the MB code, here's the important part. We're pulling in the currency code file, the, the currency code view, we're assigning it to the currency code view variable, and then through some magic, it's now available within that inner function. The ES6 version of this looks like this. So the import statement is so clear because you know what file you're importing from, what it's being assigned to, and it's globally available in this file now. I also love the export because now you can see what is being exported from this file. It's, it's very clear, it's very easy. You have import, you have export. Here's a full example. So next, let's talk about some lessons we learned during our first actual React pull request. So at this point, the infrastructure's in place, everyone's super excited. What should our strategy be moving forward? So this is our flow. We thought, oh, okay, what feature should we move over first? Because for us, rewriting the whole app is a non-starter. We have to do it incrementally. How can we do this gradually? So you look in here and you're like, okay, which, which of these are the least important feature? So everything on here is pretty important. Okay, why don't we pick the notes widget down here? Here you see the state with the placeholder, and once you, once you type in it, it starts growing and shrinking, and you have a counter in the, in the bottom right. This is probably the least important feature in this flow because, and this is an important thing, if we're gonna screw up something when we push this out to prod, I wanna screw up the message that is accompanying the transaction. I do not wanna screw up who I'm sending money to. And I do not wanna screw up the amount of money that I'm sending. If my friend says he wants to send his other friend $100 and I charge him $1,000, that's gonna be a really bad thing, right? I'll probably get fired. Well. Probably not, but maybe. <laughs> okay, so this is also a, 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 a good example because it's sufficiently complicated. We have a placeholder so we can test our IETN stuff. We have some JavaScript functionality. There's some resize going on. So my wife went out of town. I said, okay, I'm gonna spend this weekend and just move this thing over. So I opened my first PR, and, and here's all the awesome things I put in. Okay, I moved the dust template over to React and JSX, which was awesome. I decoupled the resize logic from Backbone. I wrote some tests for the resize code because there, there weren't tests for it yet. Added an underscore underscore test folder next to the code because that's what React does and it looked like a cool pattern and I wanted to try it out. And then I changed the testing helpers to work with the underscore underscore tests. And this got merged the next day, right? No, wah wah. So what should I have done instead? It should have been much simpler. These were the only two things necessary because the only things that have to change here are the template and the event binding logic, right? But I was really excited and I wanted to experiment and I wanted to do, hey, let's try this, hey, let's try this. But that increased the burden for my peers 
because I said, well, I want to try this pattern and this pattern and this pattern. And they're like, well, let's have a meeting. Let's talk about it. There's just too much. So the lesson here is keep your first PR dead simple. If you have to have it be simpler than this just to get it in, then do that. OK. The next lesson is optimize for future change. So it's only been two years, and we're switching out our entire front end infrastructure. That is not a lot of time. And if that holds true again for the future, it means in two years, I may switch my client side stack again entirely. And we like having that freedom, but that means we have to think about how do we reduce the cost of switching? And so around this time, I found this great quote. You have to build a barrier between yourself and the framework. This is by Michael Feathers. He wrote this great book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And a lot of us do that. So what does this actually mean? And if you only take away one thing from my talk, have it be this. Use as much vanilla JavaScript as possible. Now, I don't mean to avoid React or React Router or Flux or all these great things. Yes, please use those. Those are solving very specific problems. But for the rest of it, keep it framework agnostic if you can. So in our example here, everything is tightly coupled right now. And this prevents us from changing. So let's take a look at the example of the notes widget, right? So let's narrow down to the important pieces. Here I have the event binding logic on the top, and in the bottom is the business logic. When I type in the text area, what actually happens? But what actually has to change here when I want to move from Backbone to React? The only thing that really has to change is the event binding stuff, and then I have to decouple this business logic down here. So what does that look like? If I move the business logic out into a separate file, in this case, I've called it a resized text area util. I can now reference it here, pull it in here really easily, but I can make it generic enough that it can be pulled in from a React component. It can be pulled in from a backbone thing at the same time if I have to. And the really nice thing here is that future framework versions can use the same thing. So I don't have to change this part of my code every time. Because the reality is, if you don't build a barrier now, your legacy React code in two years will be just as painful to migrate as your legacy backbone code is right now. That's just the reality. So now that we've made it easier to migrate, what's the next biggest blocker? How do you convince people? So let's talk about culture for a second. So how many people here are already on React? OK. Again, about half or a third. OK. And how do people normally react? Um, to change. This is what happens, right? What? You're making me switch again. We just moved everything over to this framework. Are you crazy? That's what happens, right? So what do we have to do? I'm going to harp on this again. We have to reduce the cost of change. Because if we can reduce that and reduce the pain that's necessary to change, we'll get a lot less pushback. Things are less tightly coupled. So our, our culture on my team at PayPal is, is um, pretty receptive to new stuff. If there's something new in two years that we want to move to, we'll do that. And that'll be fine. So a lot of things that, next we'll talk about a lot of things that worked for us as far as culture goes. Conferences. We got five people from our team going to React Conf. This gets people unified and jazzed up and excited and on the same page. This can't be understated. So if your coworkers aren't here, they should be here. OK, hack sessions over lunch. This is a great time to come in and say, hey, I ported this one feature over. Look at how much cleaner it looks, how much better this works. And this is a great place to address questions like, or address statements like, HTML in JS, are you crazy? So this worked really well for us. Distributing the work. Jamin worked on the infra pieces. I worked on the React pieces, and that worked out great. Here's another one. Don't alienate your last architect. If you go to him and say, well, this whole thing really sucks, you're just going to make enemies. So don't try and work with him. Say, this works. This doesn't work. Let's fix this. Keep momentum. OK. So in conclusion, <clears throat> you have to make sure to solve real problems. What pain are you fixing? Because everything we've heard about here, this is all cool stuff. This is all really fun stuff, right? Um, I'll share an anecdote. I have enough time. Um, so my last job, I was at Family Search. It was a great place. Shout out to you guys in the front. Um, at the time, there was a lot of articles going around around, hey, you don't really need jQuery. You can drop it now. There's enough support. So, so I was like, hey, we should drop jQuery. This, 
this will be really cool. And uh, I was talking to some of the engineers about it. I was, I was seeing how they felt about it. And uh, the response I got was, please don't make me change. I am overwhelmed keeping up with our stack as it is. So the reality there was that I wasn't really solving any pain. I was just wanting to try something out. And that's valid in certain cases. But in this case, it would have made their lives a lot more difficult if we would have had removed that. So that leads me to my final thought. The principles that you learned here at React Rally are really to help you solve real problems. If you don't have pain, don't make your team suffer. If you're facing problems, you can start applying these solutions we talked about today with or without React. Thank you.